Hello, everyone. Welcome to Creativity in Technology webinar series. I am the host, Noya. This is our fourth talk, and I am very glad to have Dr. David Crofley here talking about the promotion of creativity and of innovation in engineering education. Hi, Dr. Crofley. Sorry, a slight delay there while I, I turned everything on. Hi, Noah, it's, it's good to see you. And, and uh, I see there's a number of people already um, registered. So thank you everybody for coming. Yeah, so Dr. Cropley is the Professor of Engineering Innovation at the University of South Australia. He is a recognized expert in creative problem solving and innovation. He wrote eight books, including the topics of a history of human creativity, creativity in engineering problem solving, and the psychology of innovation in organizations. He was also a scientific consultant and on-screen expert for the Australian ABC TV documentaries, including Redesign My Brain and Life at Nine. So the structure for today's talk is that Dr. Cropley will give a presentation for 20 to 30 minutes. If you have any question, you can either leave them in the Q&A box, so you can see that on the bottom of the screen, and or you can click on raise your hand. After the presentation, we will go through some of some of the written questions. We will also unmute some of you to ask questions directly. And now I can't wait to listen to the presentations. Are you ready, Dr. Cropley? I am. I'm, I'm just sort of pressing buttons. Uh, I'll quickly exit from my email just so there's no distractions of messages and things coming. So I'm, I'm ready to go and I'll, I'll start sharing my screen in a minute. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. All right. Well, uh, before I, I turn on the PowerPoint, just to make it a little bit more friendly and personal, I just wanted to thank Noya for organizing this and thank you uh, for attending and for the opportunity to say uh, a few words about creativity. Um, I, I, I was taken aback initially because I thought, well, where are, are the, the attendees? But I realized that uh, it's been set up so that uh, I can see you there on the participant list, but the, the screen isn't full of, of uh, everybody's images. So I did have a peek and I, I saw two names. So I just want to see, quickly say hello to Yuri from RMIT. Uh, Yuri Belsky and I um, have met a couple of times. He's a, a professor at RMIT in Melbourne. And also I, I noticed uh, Paul Ekblom, uh, whom I haven't interacted with for a while, but Paul's, uh, I, I assume, still based in London. And we crossed paths probably uh, about 10 years ago and now talking in particular about creativity in the context of crime and, and related things. So uh, just a quick hello to Paul as well. Okay, what I'm going to do now is uh, I've got some PowerPoint slides to talk to and to share with you. So I'm gonna share the screen in just a second um, and I'll go through those. Of course, you'll, you'll hear me speaking and, and so on. And if you do have any questions, just follow the instructions that Nui gave but we'll have 10 or 15 minutes, I think, at the end, well before uh, the, the seminar that follows. So you'll have an opportunity to, to do those and ask questions. So let me just uh, make sure that I press the right buttons here now. I know we've all been using Zoom and, and various things, but of course, I still have to pause and, and think for a moment or two before, before doing anything. Okay, looks like we're set up. I, I, I think you can all see that now. So we'll, we'll get straight into it. And in fact, let me just do it properly and put it in the presentation mode. There we go. That way I can position the, the images that I can see right down the bottom in that blue slab and that's nicely out of the way. And I'll also just set up the, the laser pointer here just in case I need it. So um, what I wanted to, to begin by saying very quickly is that the title of the presentation that you see there, Promoting Creativity and Innovation in Engineering Education. Uh, the reason I've chosen that is that uh, naturally, apart from, from giving you some uh, reasonably clear idea of what I'm going to talk about, it is also the title of a paper that I published uh, back in 2015 on obviously the same topic. Uh, so I thought that's a, a good way to tie it to a, a paper, and I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the full details of that paper at the end of the presentation. And uh, if, I, if you see me looking down at my watch, I'm trying to do that sort of surreptitiously, but I am just keeping an eye on the time to make sure that I don't uh, go over and uh, run into the next session. So let me begin by, now what I wanted to do uh, really by way of, of kicking this off is rather than giving you a, a maybe a sort of standard lecture on you know, background and some theory and so on, I wanted to start really with uh, by describing a problem. 
And uh, in the context of creativity in engineering education in particular, uh, the, the overarching problem that I see that exists, and, and I say this with, uh, you know, to some extent, I'm trying to be a little bit provocative. So uh, if any of you feel that uh, I'm being you know, too close to the bone, please don't take offense. But if you ask me, creativity in a deliberate sense is largely absent from engineering degrees. And I mean in a deliberate sense. So in a systematic, very you know, built-in, holistic way, I see that it's largely absent. And, and of course, uh, you know, I'll, I'll explain myself a little bit as we go along. Uh, so that's the overarching problem. But I see, uh, as you can see on this slide, at least three contributing problems or contributing factors that, that start to explain why that is. So I want to, first of all, uh, sort of hit you between the eyes with this message that there's a problem in engineering education in relation to creativity. There are some causal factors uh, and once we've addressed that, then we'll start to talk about, okay, well, what, what should we do about it? And also, why should we do something about it? In other words, why is creativity of such value that it should be present in our engineering degrees? Uh, so one of the problems, I'll, I'll go through them in order uh, that they are in the table here. The first problem I, I like to describe, as you can see, is the over-specialization problem. And the, the way that that manifests itself is that I believe uh, the, the modern trend in engineering education is generally towards degrees that focus on very narrow specializations. And in fact, if you look at the history of, of engineering education, at least say since the Second World War, there are at least a couple of waves or phases of kind of going back and forth from a generalist approach, then back to a kind of narrow specialist approach and, and back and forth. But I believe that we're currently in a, a fairly sort of specialist, narrow focus kind of trend uh, in recent years. And so there's nothing inherently in, uh, wrong with that, except that one of the consequences as far as creativity is concerned, is that these narrow specialization engineering degrees, I believe, create a, a, an excessive focus on technical content. And because there's only so many hours in the week and so many weeks in the semester, what seems to happen there is that it leaves very little room for creativity. So problem number one, you can tie back to the over-specialization of engineering degrees. The, the, the question of whether they should or shouldn't be specialized to the degree that they are is, is kind of a separate conversation. It's more of a, an environmental factor. Uh, the second problem I see is what I describe as the problem of pseudo-expertise. And uh, I believe there's, and again, these, these are not absolutes, but tendencies. Uh, I see a symptom of this is that it's really a, a the fact that engineering degrees tend to uh, focus or, or tend to sort of lean towards uh, an excessive focus on factual knowledge. And I mean factual or declarative knowledge in contrast to other forms of knowledge that, for example, conditional knowledge, which is about when and why we do things, uh, or procedural knowledge. There's a tendency towards more sort of declarative factual knowledge. One of the consequences of this that I'll speak to a little bit more in a moment is that uh, often there's a danger that we fail to achieve a threshold of, of what we call adaptive expertise. And that has a strong connection to creativity, uh, which manifests itself again as uh, a lack of space for creativity in the curriculum. And then the last problem is slightly different. I call it the lack of knowledge problem. And the issue here is, is that I see, and it's a problem in creativity in general in society, but it's, it's a sort of manifestation is that on the rare occasions when there is a, a deliberate focus on creativity in engineering education, uh, there tends to be a, a sort of habit of kind of going back and reinventing the wheel, basically, and ignoring the, the large body of knowledge from creativity research uh, that, that answers questions like what is creativity and can it be taught? So in simple terms, we know the answer to those questions already. They've been studied in depth for many years, but often what I've seen a, a few times in engineering education is that people tend to sort of think that this is the first time that anybody's thought about creativity in, in engineering and it must be different. So we're gonna to have to start from first principles. What tends to happen is that a lot of energy is expended, but people then kind of get tired, move on to other things and, and never really make a lot of progress uh, except to, to sort of revisit issues. So these three problems together, we don't need to, to dwell on them too much, 
uh, are setting up this sort of environment where I believe it's very hard to get creativity into engineering degrees in a, in a holistic, integrated, and systematic way. And as I'm going to continue to explain, there's a desperate need for this, so we've got a problem. Now, if I move uh, on to the next slide, I wanted to talk briefly just a little bit more about this, uh, this idea of pseudo or adaptive expertise. Uh, the simple way to look at this diagram is if you look at the, the top horizontal axis, axis, the level of understanding and the vertical axis, what we should be trying to do in, in something like an engineering degree, in fact, in other professional degrees as well, is developing in students deep understanding of functioning knowledge. Unfortunately, what often tends to happen in a lot of situations is, as I hinted at before, that we tend to be sort of sitting up in the top left corner, which means the level of understanding that's being developed is not as deep as it could be. And the kind of knowledge that's being uh, developed is more factual or declarative. So in general, we, we should be aiming towards moving from top left down to bottom right, and bottom right is this thing called adaptive expertise. So that's our goal. That's what we should be trying to do. And the connection to creativity is very important because I believe, and, and I think we can make a strong case, that an adaptive expert in an engineering sense is not just an engineer with deep engineering knowledge, with deep functioning knowledge of engineering, but it's also a person who has these other uh, capabilities, for example, creativity, and, and also other things, critical thinking, communication skills. So if we're really going to talk about an adaptive expert in engineering in the true sense, it's about more than just the, the subject knowledge or more than just the domain knowledge. There are other qualities as well that, that are important, and, and that's where creativity begins to sort of push into the picture. Now, one uh, way to look at that is we can think of this idea of the adaptive expert in engineering with, with all of the, the sort of skills and abilities and competencies that they, they need. Really, that's a, a discussion about thinking of, of engineering and engineering creativity as a competency. The important difference here is between skills and competencies. A skill is, is a more narrow uh, sort of... Um, particular ability, whereas a competency is a broader, more long-lasting, more transferable capability that consists of a combination of skills, knowledge, and also, very importantly, attitudes and dispositions. So the, the general line that I've been pushing for a while in, in using different language sometimes is basically that if we're thinking uh, only in terms of skills, we're thinking the wrong way because skills ignore some of these other important factors. So the first thing is that we should think of, of both engineering, really, and creativity as competencies. And when we put those in the context of this idea of the adaptive expert, then we, we really begin to see a much richer picture emerging. And, and of course, the point of that is that it's a richer picture that helps to guide us into how should we design engineering programs to, to, to achieve, to create the sort of person that I'm describing as the adaptive expert. So, so maybe a, a kind of message number one is we need to be starting to think of creativity and engineering together as a competency, not just a skill. Now, there's some grounds to, to uh, you know, say that this is not just me um, making up my own ideas. It's not the ravings of a, of a nutcase, but there is a lot of uh, other evidence suggesting that other people are thinking in this way. A very good example is the, the discussions, the information that we've seen in recent years, uh, for example, from the World Economic Forum. You may have seen examples of these future of jobs report. I think this particular example is from 2015, but they publish one every year. And what they've been doing uh, in recent years is talking about, now I know they use the term skills here, but but whether we won't worry too much about skill versus competency for a second. Uh, they've identified the fact and talking to, to companies and all sorts of organization that basically these are the sorts of skills, I'll call them competencies, that uh, people really need to thrive in the 21st century. And of course, engineers as much as anybody else. So I link this uh, really to also to the impact of industry four, you know, digitization, 
the growth of AI, automation, and so on, and the impact that's having on the future of work. Now, that's a, a bit of a, a side conversation that we don't have time for now, but really the thing that's driving this, this recognition that we need more skills in creativity, problem solving, and so on, is the fact that as AI and automation take over routine jobs in society more and more, the jobs that are left, the jobs that remain, are the jobs that, that uh, trade on the things that people are good at and the things that computers and AI cannot do. And I make a, a strong argument that that really revolves around creativity. So what we're seeing with, with this sort of information is uh, that if you don't think that creativity is important in engineering from what I've said previously, this, this sort of information should be starting to, to back that up and strengthen that argument that, that there's a widespread understanding that creativity, problem solving and related skills are important, uh, again, I'll call them competencies that people are going to need to, to have successful uh, vibrant jobs and job opportunities in the future. And of course, engineers more so than, or as much as any other profession. So what's the solution then? If, if creativity is as important as I'm saying, as other organizations are saying, and at the same time, if it's not really present, at least to the degree that it should be in engineering programs, then what's the solution? Well, I, I think in terms of, uh, of several principles or several sort of guiding uh, ideas. First of all, I've already said it, that uh, we need to start understanding creativity as a competency. And I'll explain it a little bit more explicitly, uh, a model for that in a few minutes. But we've got to make this transition. And really, once we think of creativity as a competency, the important consequence of that for engineering education is that we stop thinking of it as a, a little sort of package that can be added into a degree. And you know, if we put three modules in a first year course in the first semester, then we can tick the creativity box. Once we see creativity as a competency, we have to start looking at it in a holistic sense. And we have to start understanding that it's got to be present everywhere in the curriculum because it's an essential part of making these adaptive experts, these engineers that are gonna go out into the world and solve the sort of problems that we face. Related to that, another principle for, for the solution to this problem is to see creativity as a key outcome. Now, I've, I've kind of already said that uh, once we start thinking in terms of the adaptive expert that engineering degrees are not fundamentally about filling people's heads with, with knowledge of engineering. They're really about creating uh, technological problem solvers in, in, in an adaptive expert sense. Once we, we start to think like that, then again, we go back to this idea that, that there's more than just the knowledge of engineering that's required to achieve that adaptive expert, that technological problem solver. So it, it helps us to, to think in holistic terms. And then more specifically, perhaps one of the ways that we, we need to be doing this is what I'm saying here to start at the end. What I mean by that is basically, you could think of it as a kind of supercharged problem-based approach. Now, some people might roll their eyes and think, okay, it's, he's just talking about problem-based learning. But I mean problem-based learning, not in an individual subject sense, but, but as a guiding philosophy for the whole degree. So I could envisage uh, a future where when students come into their the first day of, of first year in their engineering degrees, they're immediately presented, put into teams and presented with a substantial problem, a substantial technological problem that needs to be solved. And in the problem based sense, they then go out and, and seek out the knowledge that they'll need, but also the other skills or the other abilities, competencies and so on that they'll need, like creativity, in order to achieve uh, the, the goal here, which is not to get through first year and then get through second year, but it's to become an adaptive expert, it's to become a technological problem solver. So a really sort of uh, massive scale, as I said, a supercharged version of problem-based learning where, where we're focused on creating adaptive experts who are creative problem solvers, but you know, really, really change the way that we present the whole philosophy of an engineering degree. So of course, what, what I'm saying is that we need to actually be uh, quite creative in our approach to the engineering degree itself. Okay, now uh, I want to, having, having, and of course we're, we're, we have to be fairly sort of um, brief in this discussion, but I hope having 
at least convinced you to some degree that that there is a problem that there's not enough creativity in engineering education and that that it is a necessary and valuable thing i want to give you a, a few stories now just to back that up to really sort of reinforce the message that that of the the most vital element of engineering is the ability to come up with new and effective solutions to technological problems that's that's why engineers exist so i'm, I'm continuing to push along this line of thinking of engineering education as having the goal of producing adaptive experts, basically with this competency in engineering creativity or engineering problem solving. Uh, a couple of examples and stories to do that. I wanna start by telling you the, the story of Smith Corona. Now Smith Corona, uh, some of you, uh, at least maybe Yuri and Paul, uh, for example, will remember typewriters and, and like me, perhaps even, you know, typed up a, an honors thesis or something on one. Uh, but uh, Smith Corona was, was a typewriter manufacturer, a very successful one for about 100 years from the late 18th century, sorry, the late 19th century to uh, the 1980s. And this is an interesting story because, you know, you often hear in talks about creativity and innovation. In fact, people have said to me a couple of times, oh, God, you're not going to give us the Kodak story, you know, a company that didn't innovate and failed. This is, this is a little bit different from examples like Kodak because Smith Corona was quite a creative company or let's say quite an innovative company. They were quite good at coming up with new solutions, new technological solutions. So it's not a story about a complete lack of creativity. But in some ways, it's more powerful because it shows that even if you are creative, sometimes that on its own is not enough. What happened to, to Smith Corona is they spent 100 years making better and better typewriters. And they, they innovated in all sorts of ways, from mechanical typewriters like you see there to a more modern uh, electronic typewriters that had auto-correcting ribbons and, and uh, you know, instead of mechanical keys or electronic keys and so on. So a very innovative company. And yet, in 1981, something happened, and you can probably guess what that, that thing was. It was the introduction of the IBM PC and, and followed by the introduction of electronic word processors. And within a matter of only about 12 months, uh, Smith Corona had gone bust. And they, they tried to sort of reconstitute themselves, tried again, but we actually went bust a second time, not long after. And what's interesting about that, and it teaches us something very important that's, that's vital for creativity in engineering and, and uh, innovation in engineering, uh, it illustrates and teaches us a few lessons that I'm gonna to summarize for you in a moment. But I like to say that the, 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 the moral of this story about Smith Corona was that being creative, being innovative engineers is, as I say here, fine, as long as nothing changes. So to really understand what we need to do and to understand the value of creativity, and, and you'll notice I'm, I'm also using the word innovation sort of interchangeably at the moment, but we'll, we'll get to that later, um, that, that the, the driving force behind the need for technological creativity or innovation is the idea of change. So I want to explain that and, and illustrate that a little bit for you uh, just quickly now. Uh, now, this is quite a busy diagram, but I'll, I'll break it down for you very quickly. Basically, what is happening when we're working as technological problem solvers, as engineers, is that we face uh, four possible situations that are described by the two axes here. So the driving forces are here are problems and solutions. And to, to illustrate what I mean here, uh, Smith Corona was basically operating in these two quadrants that I'm highlighting now. And the, the common factor of those two quadrants is that Smith Corona saw the problems that they were solving as basically existing, well-understood, well-known problems of how to, how to give people typewriters. And they approached that in one of two ways. They said, well, we can, we can keep building the sort of typewriters that we, we've always built, replication or doing, the way, doing things the way we currently do them, and people buy our typewriters. And occasionally, we can work in some incremental innovation or creativity, which is basically doing things better or faster or cheaper. And they found that they could make a very good business by basically addressing a known stable problem and just occasionally innovating and then, then churning out 
uh, understood, well understood solutions and that kept them in business. And the, the example I gave before, that's fine as long as nothing changes, uh, is we now see the, the impact of that, that once the IBM PC was introduced, what changed was basically a new technology or a new solution redefined the problem. So what happened to Smith Corona was that while they were busy doing this, the, the left-hand side of the diagram, the problem had actually changed and the problem had become a new problem. And then Smith Corona had the, the difficulty that when they thought they were replicating, what they were actually doing was cranking out the same old solution to a new problem, which put them in this quadrant of stagnation. In other words, they were doing what Einstein once described as, you know, if you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, that's the definition of insanity. So uh, Smith Corona's problem uh, was that when this new problem occurred, they approached it, in fact, in two ways. They, they tried to keep doing what they'd always done, which inevitably led to stagnation, or they, they tried the other trick up their sleeve, which, which was a bit of incrementation, but that was really just improving what they already had. And basically, they failed to understand that a new problem required a new solution, which IBM had already introduced. So uh, Smith Corona was unable to make that transition to disruptive innovation. So this diagram both helps us to understand what happened to Smith Corona. It also helps us to understand that sometimes just being incrementally innovative or creative is not enough. And that eventually you need also to introduce completely new things. Uh, aside from Smith Corona, the, the message is also that as engineers, uh, we spend some of our time working in this replica replication quadrant but we always have to have one eye on incrementation and even one eye on disruption. Uh, Coca-Cola talks about these three quadrants. They call the replication quadrant the now quadrant. They call incrementation what they're going to do next. And they call this disruption quadrant the things that they're going to do sort of further out into the future. So creativity and creativity, of course, underpins all of this because creativity is about finding new solutions to new problems. So we can uh, we can sum up what um, Smith Corona experienced a little bit more generally in this diagram that change occurs and your business as engineers is responding to changes like the introduction of a, of a different product by a competitor or like demographic changes or like the emergence of the coronavirus or climate change. Change occurs around us all the time. It leads to two things, market pull, in other words, new needs, and it also can lead to technology push or new possibilities or to put those in more explicit terms, change ultimately leads to new problems and new solutions. And the process of connecting those two things together is what engineers spend their careers doing. That is, that arrow there is basically the process of innovation, connecting new problems to new solutions. Now, going back to, to begin to sort of, uh, to wrap things up over the next five minutes, uh, if creativity and its cousin innovation are so important to, to the things that we do, the way we respond to the world around us, and, and they're absolutely central to engineering, then again, we should see more and more that, that this is something that must be present in engineering degrees, in engineering education. Otherwise, we're not preparing students to take their place in the world as adaptive experts with this particular competency in engineering, creative problem solving. So I want to uh, I'm gonna give you one more example, uh, and then I'll just uh, finish with a couple of slides explaining the, the final piece of the puzzle, which is what is this thing we call creativity and, and what does it consist of? So one more example, uh, just to, to sort of hammer home the, the importance of creativity and why we need it, especially as engineers. I wanna use the example of, uh, basically the example of diminishing returns. Now a classic example to explain this concept of diminishing returns is to imagine farming, growing crops. And we know that we can increase the yield of a crop for example, by putting some fertilizer on it, the, the horizontal axis. So as we add some fertilizer, the crop yield goes up. However, we also know that if we keep doing that, then more fertilizer doesn't just indefinitely yield to a higher crop yield. At some point, 
the increased yield starts to diminish because too much fertilizer, perhaps it starts killing the crop or the crop can't absorb any more fertilizer. And so this sort of thing, it can happen and, and the, the crop yield in fact can even go into decline if we put too much on there. That first point there where the curve starts to flatten is the point of diminishing returns and that point there is the point of negative returns. Now, what's the connection to uh, technological problem solving and creativity? Well, really, you can think of, of the, the process of identifying that you can put fertilizer on a crop to incre increase or uh, add to the crop yield is an example of incremental creativity or incremental innovation. We do something better or a bit faster or a bit cheaper. We, we incrementally improve it. We can improve the crop yield. The important message for creativity and innovation though is that a smart engineer knows that there's no point in, in continuing with that solution beyond the point of diminishing returns because it becomes unviable or even, even uh, puts us into reverse. So true innovation driven by creativity uh, at the point of diminishing returns recognizes that we've done enough incremental innovation and we have to move to a new solution. In other words, we have to, to do some disruption for example, uh, if we want to keep that crop yield curve heading up at a nice steep angle, then once we've reached the point of diminishing returns, we might say, well, the next solution that we have to add, the disruption, is, for example, to irrigate the crop. And then we can incrementally improve that solution a little bit until it reaches its point of diminishing returns, when the smart engineer, the smart creative problem solver will say, that's enough of that incremental solution, we've got to add something else. Another example might be uh, using smart technology to place the seed in the ground at the correct depth so that it germinates uh, successfully rather than being blown away or not getting enough water. And by applying this combination of both incremental uh, improvements, incremental creativity and innovation, coupled with the occasional disruptive solution added into the picture, that's the way that we really keep society, keep the economy and so on moving forward and moving ahead in spite of the changes that occur around us constantly. So the, the last little segment and Nyoya, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my eye on the time. So uh, about another five minutes or so, and then we can take some questions. Uh, what do we do about this? Well, I've already said, you know, we have a problem in engineering education. We, we need first to recognize uh, that there is an issue there. I've discussed some of the, the features of that and thinking about creativity as a competency and so on. Despite all of those things, uh, there, there, there remains one challenge and it's a challenge that we see across society. It's not just engineers, uh, but you know, really, if you ask generally a person in the street, what they think creativity is and so on, you'll get a lot of sort of myths and misconceptions. So the, the last point I'm making here is that, uh, that the, these myths and misconceptions really are part of this lack of knowledge problem, the third one that I described earlier. Uh, I use this particular um, cover of Time magazine, this came out two years ago, uh, to illustrate this point. And so the articles in, in this special edition are all good articles. I know some of the authors and they're, they're perfectly good articles on the science of creativity, but some magazine editor somewhere thought that this would be a good image to put on the cover. And the problem with this image is that it plays to several myths about creativity. The problem of those myths is that they hold back the conversation. And you know, if you want to embed it, creativity in an engineering degree, it's frustrating if the first thing you have to do is spend time untangling these myths so that we can get on with a, a sort of baseline common understanding and move forward from there. Uh, so I don't want to dwell on this, but, but one of the myths here is this idea, a very persistent idea that the, the right brain, the right hemisphere of the brain is the creative hemisphere. The left hemisphere is the logical hemisphere. That's been well and truly debunked in the last decade or so with brain imaging studies that show that when people are, are engaging in creativity uh, of, of a variety of kinds, the, the brain, the, the, the regions of the brain that are active are spread all over the brain. But there's still a very persistent myth about left brain, right brain. And it's not that that's necessarily a, a problem in itself, but it, it represents one of these barriers that, that we have to overcome. If we're going to have sensible, uh, deep conversations about embedding creativity in engineering, we've, we've got to get past the myth and misconception. 
uh, just for, for interest's sake, another um, one of the, the common myths that's illustrated by this diagram simultaneously is the idea that that creativity is something to do with art. And so not only has the, the editor here suggested that creativity is a right brain activity, but also that that's the artistic part of the brain. So by splashing colors and so on. And on. I, I, I mean, I'm sure you'll probably all agree with me, but uh, I often have to explain to other people that you know, engineers are just as creative as, as poets and musicians. It's a slightly different kind of creativity and it manifests itself in a different way, but the underlying concept and the underlying processes uh, are very similar. So I, I like to say that you know, engineers solve technological problems, doctors solve medical problems, teachers solve educational problems, musicians solve musical problems and so on and so on, but they're all engaging in the same basic activity of finding new and effective solutions to problems. So we need to, to kind of unpick some of these myths and misconceptions. Now, the, just about the last uh, sort of piece of this puzzle then is, well, how do we start to unpick uh, those myths and misconceptions? And I think one very good way is to start by saying, well, what do we mean by creativity? And some important things to say are that we mean, first of all, that we're talking about something that's a, a characteristic or a feature or quality of individual people to begin with. We'll get in a moment to teams of people working in organizations. We need to start from this viewpoint that creativity is, is some psych individual psychosocial phenomenon. And more than that, uh, I can give you a very good, very uh, useful and helpful model. This model uh, was first proposed in the 19, early 1960s in psychology and really still forms the basis of a lot of creativity research today. Uh, very, very quickly, again, it, it reminds us or it tells us that creativity is a system of interacting elements. So if, as engineers, you know, that, that makes sense to us. We deal with systems and interaction, interaction and so on all the time. Creativity is a combination, the interaction of who we are, the person, so up here, with where we work, which uh, just for a nice sort of acronym is, is known as the press, so we can talk about the four Ps. But it's also a function of how we think, the cognitive processes. And if those three things are working together successfully in concert, then they tend to lead to creative products or outcomes or outputs. But this four Ps framework gives us a very, very good starting point for conversations about creativity. And getting back to, to creativity in engineering education, it also, I think perhaps one of the most vital things is that it reminds us that if we're going to develop this competency of engineering creativity, then it's about more than just you know, teaching people how to brainstorm, which would be an example of process. Now, there's nothing wrong with that and, and design thinking and so on, but we have to see those things as just one piece of the, the four Ps framework. We also have to understand that, that where you work or learn has a, an important impact on your ability to be creative, uh, who you are in the sense of your personality, your attitudes, your motivation, your dispositions. So all of those things impact on each other. So really what this is describing here is, is a slightly more sophisticated form of creativity as a competency. So uh, that's one piece of the puzzle for, for beginning to have this systematic holistic conversation about creativity and engineering. The, the, the next and the last piece of the puzzle in, in my talk today is to then say, what happens when, when you do this in a real setting with groups of people working in organizations? And that's where we kind of switch from talking about creativity as an individual psychosocial phenomenon to innovation as a, a kind of organizational phenomenon uh, involving groups of people. And again, to, to give it this to you, you know, in, in kind of uh, simple, straightforward terms, once we start to think about organizations and the wider problem solving process and, and innovation, then first that we have to recognize that this process happens in stages. Typically, this is a, an older model, but it's still a good one. We begin by recognizing that a problem exists. We then generate ideas, possible solutions for that. We then evaluate those ideas. And then once we've evaluated those ideas, then we can implement a solution and check that it works. And if we then combine that with the four Ps that I just described, 
we get the richest possible model that, that explains to us and helps us to understand exactly what has to happen when and what factors are important at every stage of this engineering creative problem solving process. I've just filled in one line here, but I've, I've part of my research, we've spent a lot of time looking at a much richer model of this. To give you one very quick, simple example, process or, or the, the way we think is important for creativity and innovation. But in some stages of the problem solving process, it's important to think convergently. So that means logically, analytically, or let's say critically. In other stages of the problem solving process, like idea generation, we have to think divergently, have to generate many possible solutions. So part of the secret to embedding uh, engineer or creativity in engineering and to, to managing it successfully in general is understanding that there are stages to this process and that each stage can have its own unique combination and, and sort of set of these factors of how you think, what motivates you, who you are, the organizational climate, the environment, and the kinds of products that you create. So this is the basis of a rich model of understanding exactly the, the sort of psychosocial dimensions of technological problem solving, which should be uh, something that we use to guide us in developing and redeveloping uh, engineering education to make sure that students leave this, this, these three and four year processes as adaptive experts with this competency in engineering creative problem solving. And so uh, we've still got a little bit of time up our sleeve, just while you're, you're sort of maybe pausing to, to have a yawn or to stretch or to, uh, to get ready to ask a question. I've, I've put, of course, it's a bit of, of uh, shameless self-promotion, but also um, I wanted to draw your attention to some, some possible reading matter uh, the one in the middle I uh, published in 2015 that, that really talks about all of the things I've been discussing uh, in this talk in much more detail. The other two are more recent books that are a little bit more focused on really on, on what do we do as engineers and, and why are there so many good examples of engineering creativity and technological creativity out there in the world. I basically, the first one published last year, uh, inadvertently, turned out by, by, and I swear it was an accident, I didn't intend this, but turned out to be all inventions by men. Uh, and somebody, a female colleague of mine pointed that out. And so I realized that, you know, I, I had inadvertently done that. So I had to correct that, that error by publishing this one this year, which then deliberately focused on uh, technological creativity by exclusively by women. <clears throat> and then last but not least, the, the title of the presentation this evening, I remember I mentioned that's actually based on a, a journal paper. Um, that's the reference for that journal paper there. So now it's time for me to, to pause. We've, we've got about um, probably sort of five to 10 minutes to before you know, you've then got a, a little break. I know there's a, a seminar following in about just over 15 minutes. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I went a little bit over time, but I think we've still got a little bit of time for questions. I'll um, stop sharing this. Well, uh, before I do, actually, just let me, perhaps I'll, I'll leave that there for a moment, um, just as contact details and so on there. But uh, so perhaps while we, we begin the, the Q&A process, I'll leave that on the screen for a minute or two. Thank you very much, Dr. Crawley. I think it's quite inspiring. Like I, I didn't, I'm very surprised you even talked about the neuroscience part of the brain region. This is like, I think something that maybe like needs further exploration actually. And also to uh, use those uh, sociological evidence to approve uh, the, you know, the engineering creativity and the, to approve the engineering in practice. And uh, so if you have any question, please leave it in the Q&A box or raise your hand. And before that, I do have like two questions. Can I ask first to take this chance? So the first is ahead, yeah, yeah. in the final table, in the table, you said like, what is innovation? You, you give us a table. So and the, there are four stages. So I'm just wondering, <coughs> the problem recognition one, because you've talked about, uh, we should redefine the problem. Do you think maybe the first, the first one, the process can also be divergent? If we move that, like adjust it to a more like divergent one, maybe it also helps engineer 
nearing people to be more divergent, like creative. creative. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, I mean, it's a good point. It, this, this particular model uh, is one that um, a guy called J.P. Guilford, who's sort of the father of the modern creativity era, uh, defined back in, in the 1950s. And, and I use it here because it's a, you know, it's a reasonably simple, straightforward model of the, the stages of problem solving. However, uh, there are richer models with a few more stages nowadays that, that often break that first stage up into both problem recognition and problem definition. And I think that that relates to your point that that one of those stages, probably problem definition, there is, there is an element of, of divergent thinking as well in, in you know, in being able to, to first of all, sort of conceptualize what the problem is that you're trying to solve. Um, uh, maybe a good example is, you know, people, people often, um, they, they actually define a problem in terms of the symptom of the problem rather than the underlying problem itself. Uh, and, you know, so it, it's to, to be able to really get to the heart of the problem and identify what is the real thing that we're trying to do here. There's, there may well be a, an element of, of divergent thinking there as well. But I guess the, the, the point is that all four of those P's, you, you know, you, to, to navigate your way through this creative problem solving process or through innovation, you're constantly having to switch back and forth. You know, today we might be generating ideas, which means we're thinking divergently, but tomorrow we might be evaluating the ideas, which means we've got to switch to this other way of thinking. And uh, I guess, uh, I mean, a, a, a general problem in education is often that, we're so used to being educated to think in convergent analytical terms that you know we've often forgotten how to do the divergent part of the thinking. And so uh, I mean, a related part of this whole question, not just in engineering education, but in, in education, in school education, is, is sort of rediscovering our ability to think divergently and, and to balance things out. Yeah, thank you very much. And also, I found that we have some Q&A questions in Q&A box, and we have some long questions. Uh, so, Dr. Crawley, can you see that in the Q&A box? Do you think Let me, I'll just, I've gotten rid of the screen sharing. Let me have a, a look. Wow, okay. And it's Paul. So, uh, thank you, Paul. You've, you've put me on the spot there. Let me, I'll read it out loud. I, I know other people can see it, but then that'll give me a chance to, a moment to absorb it and to, to formulate an answer. So, Paul said that, I've spoken convincingly about how boosting creativity and ad adaptability in engineering depends on how we educate and reward engineers and a bit about how innovation is supported in organizations. But is there something additional that we can do to redesign the frameworks that organize engineering knowledge? They could be made deliberately more generative and modular, allowing the production of greater and empirically, theoretically, and practically more plausible variety of solutions. A bit like the HOX genes that allow for a huge number of, yeah, um, I, I think I understand, you know, the you, the point that you're making there, Paul, and I I do agree with you. I mean, there's, uh, if I'm interpreting it correctly, uh, I think it, it's it's absolutely central to to this, uh, you know, to that the related problem of how do we how do we sort of present the discipline of engineering uh, in a different way. So you, in some ways, you're you're sort of taking what I said earlier about you know a kind of supercharged uh, problem-based approach, but not just doing that in the sense of how we present the problems, but also how we present the knowledge. And uh, so I agree completely. You know, there's a lot of, of, of um, habit and, and sort of traditional ways of doing things and, and so on that need to be challenged, uh, both in, in terms of tools and techniques, but I think it just in terms of the underlying knowledge. And maybe uh, uh, perhaps I'm straying a little bit from, from your question, but I see some of that at least in, you know, we, we've got to really ask ourselves, you know, just to what extent do engineers really need to know how to, how to solve Laplace transforms or differential equations or, or how to do, you know, spherical trigonometry, or is that something that can actually be, be addressed in a, in a different and more efficient way? Uh, I, I see that as at least beginning that conversation of, you know, what, what is the knowledge that underpins this discipline? How does that actually perhaps help or hinder being creative in that discipline? So I hope I've, I've sort of touched on, on uh, the point that you were driving at there. Um, I'll, I'll move on to the next one um, quickly. And so uh, Robert said, thank you. I've been trying to draw parallels between reverse engineering and creativity. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Hmm, uh, that's a good, I don't know. That's a good question, Robin. I, I understand 
uh, the point you're making. I, I haven't thought about it before. I, 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 rather than trying to, to bluff my way through an answer, um, I think I'll have to, to think about that a little bit more. But uh, it's an interesting point. And, and so I assume everybody probably understands that you know, when, when we're talking about reverse engineering, basically sort of you know, picking apart a system to, to sort of understand how it works. I mean, I think maybe one comment to make is that in a process like that, uh, we can often reveal opportunities where something maybe could be done better. So perhaps that's the uh, a reverse engineering approach to opens up some opportunities to to kind of go reverse engineer a certain extent and then kind of move sideways to a better solution. Uh, good. So yeah, please please flick me a message on LinkedIn or or by email. And uh, Hannah has got one there. I'm sorry, my eyesight is is terrible these days. Can I help this? Or I, I can no, no, it's okay. I've, I've got it. Uh, she said that this innovation model seems to be similar or related to the double diamond model of design thinking. Yep. So when exploring the problem first, it can be divergent before we, we uh, continue on with convergence. So, and I think, um, let me scroll down a little bit. Uh, you're absolutely right. And of course, they, there should be a strong similarity because really design thinking traces its its history back to you know, to creative problem solving and, and most of this stuff really finds its its modern origins uh, back with people like Guilford in, in the 1950s. Uh, but as I said, the, and as, as you're indicating, uh, there are richer models nowadays that have, have added stages and explained the stages in more detail. So uh, I, I agree with you there completely. And there's a question from Emma, thank you for the inspiring presentation. Thank you. Hopefully all the educational institutions will recognize and change their way of education. Uh, while I can easily see how creativity and innovation can be incorporated in a program, however, the question of assessment required, yep, in particular with the diversity of the level of awareness. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's there are related challenges, but I, I guess I'll say two things. Uh, towards the beginning of your comment, I mean, I hope organizations do. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not as hopeful as you might think uh, I should be. Um, I, partly because, I mean, in my own engineering department, I've had the experience over the years of people literally saying to me, you know, you can have as much of that creativity rubbish as you like, as long as we don't take anything else out of the degree. And, and I realize that's a polite way of telling me to, to shut up and go away. So uh, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic, but I think, the, if, if ever there was a time where some progress on this might be made, it's now because there's something kind of qualitatively different about the conversation uh, about creativity and education in the last couple of years, I think driven by this whole industry for AI and automation, that there's been waves in the past of, of creativity becoming popular in education, and then it's died off again because nothing really happened. I think uh, circumstances are, are pushing it to the front again. And I think it, the, the whole question of industry four and so on and the future of work has sharpened up what it is that creativity offers. But you're, you're also right that there are questions of, of assessment and so on. But I, on the optimistic side, I would say, you know, these are just other problems for which there are creative solutions uh, and th that we can find. It, it might take a bit of time and effort, but I'm sure there are are productive and sensible ways to address the the questions that come out of a change of philosophy like this that 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 will find a way to solve. Okay, uh, I think that's that's all of the questions we've got on the screen. So, Mueller, would you like to? Yes. Um, so probably wrap things up now. Yes. So thank you very much, Dr. Cropley. I think like, so today we do have some like audience raise your hand. I'm sorry because we have very limited time for now. So we can't answer all of your questions. So I think Dr. Cropley is very happy to receive further emails from you and talk about more about engineering education, engineering create creativity, right? So yep. I'll just share that, uh, that final screen there again, in case anybody didn't, uh, so just, just in the last minute or so, you've got, I mean, by all means, send me a, an email. The top line there is my, my university email, but I, I added the other things you can see, like ResearchGate, for example, you can find a lot of publications there uh, if you're interested as well. Yes. 
So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Cropley. And uh, I hope you all enjoy this talk. And uh, yes, I'll see you later. Thank you. Okay, thank you. you are. Thank you, everyone. It was, it was good sort of talking to you through the ether and so on. But uh, thank you very much for your, for your attention. And thank you for the questions. And I hope you found it interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.